Hello, everyone. Welcome to Rural Insights Podcast, another edition. And today I'm excited to uh, have uh, three Northern Michigan University alumnus, is that such a word, alumnus, alumni, I guess. Uh, and, uh, and also all three former students of mine, uh, and all three smarter than I am right now. So, uh, and they're all running, all running important cities, uh, one in the Southeast Michigan, uh, in a, uh, outside of the Detroit area. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, uh one in, uh, large city in the, uh, Northern Michigan, Ludington. And, and one city manager in the UP here of our big city, Sault Ste. Marie, uh, and uh, uh, one, of the, one of the big, uh, big three cities in, in the peninsula. And what we want to do today is talk to the three of them about their experiences and what's going on in their experiences in their city, what their challenges are, uh, maybe what their risks are. And then I'm going to t- ask them to talk about uh, sort of rural cities uh, or smaller cities of the future, uh, not cities of, of uh, 600,000 or millions, but the si- and they'll tell you about the size of their city. So, gentlemen, welcome and thank you very much uh, for being here. And uh, so, Nick, why don't you tell us about, about uh, uh, f- first of all, w- what year did you graduate from Northern? If you don't mind telling that, and uh, and tell us about your city and what challenges and threats are. All right. Well, thank you for having me here, and it's good to have some fellow uh, NMU city managers. There's not many of us, but it, it's great to have some colleagues among us today. Um, I enjoyed my time at Northern Michigan University very much. I graduated with a poli sci degree in 2011, and then a master's of public administration in. Uh, 2015 um, from NMU as well. So I have been the city manager of Girls Point Park, Michigan for the last two years. Uh, I previously worked there for another three years as an assistant city manager and assistant two. Uh, my population is about 11,500 with a 1.7 square miles. And if you don't uh, know, there's five Girls Points um in in the area so i am the second largest gross point i border um two major um arteries of roads uh, with the border of detroit and i also border gross point city and we have lake st Clair along our way uh very proud to have two private municipal parks which is very odd for uh, uh, the gross points are one of the few communities that have private parks where residents pay more in their taxes in order to have that privacy um, that's only relevant for just the owner of the um, uh, gross point park. So the biggest challenges that are happening today within gross point park uh, would say in regards to, and I'm sure Mitch and Brian would both agree to me is infrastructure. Uh, We just had two major storm events in June and July of this year down in Southeast Michigan that inundated us with extreme rain. In Gross Point Park, we had eight inches of rain in 24 hours. That is what equates to a thousand year storm event. Um, Typically the state mandate is that you can handle a 25 year event, which may be about three inches of rain. Um, However, none of our infrastructure was you know, built for these types of events. And so what Gross Point Park has been grappling with is we had about 75% of our homes flood uh, with a mix of storm and sewage. We have a separated sewer and water system in Gross Point Park. Um, Much of our system goes to Great Lakes Water Authority, which is the regional provider for sewer and water in Southeastern Michigan. And we actually were declared a disaster uh, by President Biden um, in seeking relief for residents, not only in Gross Point Park, the other points, city of Detroit. And so from this right now, I've been working closely with my partners um, of the other Gross Point, city of Detroit, Wayne County, in that we're seeking, how do we get this funding that is sorely needed for updating our infrastructure? Because as the suburbs were being built, Uh, throughout the years, the regional utilities were not being done with it. And so, you know, Detroit was able to serve so many residents 
they're moving up to the suburbs. That infrastructure was never built to last then in Detroit. And so you have a whole Oakland, Macomb, Wayne, Livingston, and parts of Washtenaw County all bringing their sewage and water down to Detroit. And so I've had some good conversations with Great Lakes Water Authority and other uh, regional uh, governments of sharing data and information together. Something that my experience as city manager so far is we had not been doing a very good job of working together, uh, sharing data you know, regarding our engineers or holding stuff too tight to each other. And you know, it's uh, something that we've been working together to really work together because we have in Southeast Michigan, what we believe probably a 10 to $20 billion fix just for the regional system itself um, you know, to fix our water and sewer. In the meantime, in Gross Point Park myself, I'm looking at cleaning our sewer system right now, giving uh, the residents confidence that you know they won't have hopefully other uh, sewer events down the road. And I'm also pursuing what's called a sewer outfall. In the very case of an extreme event, and when I say extreme, I'm talking a hundred years or more, which is happening seems like every two to three years now that we would discharge out into Lake St. Clair, which we don't wanna do. I love the environment, but at the same time, I have to protect my residents that are getting inundated with these extreme storm events. So uh, in a nutshell, I'd say that's probably our, our biggest concern we have nowadays. Uh, okay. We have, And so we have a very built out housing stock. Um, There's almost no developmental land. Um, Right now we're going through a city master plan process. And just in short, I'd say, what are we looking at in the future? Um, I'd say it's diversifying that housing stock. And I'd also just working with what we have available to transform in the 21st century, especially with um, uh, autonomous vehicles, you know, that is coming here. Uh, more electric vehicles. You know, I have a lot of um, residents that work closely. We're in Chrysler and General Motors and Ford. And so those are really the areas that we're looking at in the future in Gross Point Park. And I can talk about more, but I know I got two other guys here of some good stories. So thanks All a lot. All right. We're going to get back to you, Nick. Mitch, why don't you tell us about the great city of Ludington? Yeah. So, uh, the, you know, I also graduated in 2011 with a poli sci degree. Uh, so you got Nick and I on here with the call there. Um, I was, uh, after I left Northern, went to the University of Nevada, Reno, got my master's degree in public administration out there, um, then made my way back to Kingsley, Michigan for a couple of years as the village manager. Then I went to Wisconsin for four years as the village administrator in the community of Winnicani, um, just outside Oshkosh. Um, and then somehow made my way back home, which is Ludington for me. Um, we have a population uh, pre-census of right around 8,400 people um, uh, year round. Summertime, uh, Ludington is a very popular tourist destination. And so that bumps up to about 20,000 people. Countywide, we double from 25,000 to about 50,000 uh, simply in the summertime. And, and so for us, you know, we're looking at really two primary issues of concern. Uh, one is Nick already touched on is the infrastructure. I, I don't think you're going to find a city manager across the state or the nation who is not going to say that infrastructure is an issue, um, whether that is existing transmission mains, uh, uh, collection mains on both water and sewer lines, electrical infrastructure. We just had this conversation with consumers recently, um, or now, uh, you know, we'll call it unfunded mandates, uh, hopeful health improvements from a lead line perspective. But um, how do we upgrade our infrastructure locally? when over 70% of it was paid for originally by the federal and state government. These are questions that I don't think a lot of us are able to answer right now because there's no real good answer. Um, so we are trying our best locally to try to figure that out. On the other end, uh, the, the person issue or people problems. Um, for us, unlike uh, being a university town or being in the Detroit metro area, we don't have a, a primary driver other than tourism. We have made that transition, I think, in the most part to a service-based economy. And so trying to attract and retain uh, younger families to the area, um, as well as try to get those boomerangs that want to move back to the area is important. And we're not able to figure out how to do that quite yet. What we're seeing is a ton of investment in housing, uh, remodels, uh, teardowns and new builds, a lot of infill infrastructure. We've made a lot of improvements on our planning and zoning side to allow for conversions. Um, and adaptive reuse of properties. 
but what we're probably going to see is a loss of population in this most recent census of pop possibly 400 people, um, even though we've seen massive housing investment. It's an interesting dynamic that we're still trying to figure out how to deal with. Um, but for us, those two issues, the infrastructure and the people, are our big things that we've got to look at as to how to deal with those challenges moving forward. So the housing diversion, housing and affordable housing for young families is an issue in Nottington? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think I'm sure it's the same with the other gentlemen as well. You know, in a tourism town, you have people that come in, they want to retire from Chicago, Seattle, New York, Philadelphia. They buy a house for cash for significantly over asking. Um, and once that happens over and over again, the entire market inf uh, inflates uh, drastically. It's been me, it took me two and a half years to find a house to buy that I could afford in my own community. Um, and I'm at the higher end of income levels here in the community as well. And so trying to figure that out on a community wide or a region wide aspect uh, is a difficult task, but it's, it's one that I think we're, we're starting to you know, make some ground on. So uh, you used to have some manufacturing in Ludington. It used to be referred to as the sort of the lead manufacturing city in the upper Peninsula in, in northern Michigan. Is that still true? Uh, we still have some manufacturing, but I think we started to see that transition over to more of a service based. We still have okay. Whitehall Industries that does a lot of work with uh, the auto manufacturers. We still have House of Flavors that employs over 150 people doing uh, ice cream and dairy products across the country. Um, but the unfortunate fact is that, you know, when when folks are when the auto industry took the hit in 08 um, with along the U.S. 10 corridor, I'll say, took the biggest hit across the state. Um, Mason County is surrounded by two of the four poorest counties in the state of Michigan. And if you go along the U.S. 10 corridor, you hit, I think it's four of the top 10. And so this entire area of mid-Michigan has really seen a, a drastic decrease in the number of jobs in the, you know, uh, in manufacturing industry. So I think we're trying to do our best to keep some of those jobs, but also recognize we got, we've got to shift to more of a service and knowledge-based economy. Okay. So Brian, tell us about What's going on in Chippewa County, Sault Ste. Marie? Yeah, so Brian Chad, City Manager, Sault Ste. Marie. I've uh, been here a couple years now. Sault, uh, Sault Ste. Marie is about 13,000 people. Um, I graduated from Northern in 07. So I guess I'm the older of the two other gentlemen on the phone here with us. But I uh, graduated in 07 with my undergraduate and 2011 with my MPA from Northern. Uh, prior to this, did some stints in Oshkosh, uh, Vassar, Michigan, and Nagani, Michigan. But um, just to kind of reiterate some of the points that were already discussed, too, infrastructure is going to be a big issue for us. Um, we have overbuilt ourselves quite a bit. And what Sioux St. Marie is interesting about is our infrastructure extends to not just the roads, sidewalks, and underground but we have a major deep water port that the city owns that we're in the process of trying to redevelop that. Um, all of our parks facilities are all old and outdated. So our infrastructure extends out quite a bit than just the normal cement and brick and mortar. Um, one of the bigger issues that wasn't mentioned for us is staffing. Um, we have staffing challenges and that's trying to retain or more recruit applicants to fill our positions. Right now we have four open positions at the police department. We just closed out that recruitment. We got one application in. They won't even be licensed or certified until May of 2022. We have three or four openings in the fire department for firefighter paramedics. We've been recruiting those since last January. We've had one applicant um, in my time since I've been here. I've had to hire out five or six different department heads, two of them needing state certifications to operate the water system and the wastewater system. Those took about a year to fill and it's, it's becoming more challenging to find those individuals with the proper certification. So it's, it's one thing to have the infrastructure and all the assets there, but to be able to recruit and retain those individuals to actually do the work to make those assets work for you is one of our bigger challenges. And given our rural location and how far away we are from any kind of um, other population center, people really have to be dedicated or in the mindset that they want to live in Sault Ste. Marie. 
And as much as I came up here without any kind of poking or prodding, there's just not a lot of individuals like that that want to live in the rural UP. So uh, that's going to be, that is one of our bigger challenges moving forward is staffing. So what about you? Uh, you are uh, certainly the only international city in the Upper Peninsula, one of three in the state, uh, and that they have a bridge to connect to our northern neighbor, uh, uh, Canada. Um, any issues around that being an international city and complications that are a little different than other cities in Michigan? Um, I wouldn't say there's any different. Maybe there is a, um, maybe there's a greater amount, for example, being a border community, you do get involved in a lot of human trafficking cases or even um, uh, potential drug crossings across that border. So I'm sure all communities have that, but we may have a little bit more than your average, just given the location and the wanting to cross from one country into the other country. Um, one of the things that's more recently happened with the co impact of COVID and having the border closed, our local economy is heavily dependent on a lot of the Canadians coming from Sioux, Ontario to Sioux St. Marie, Michigan to do just their basic grocery shopping, getting gas, stuff like that. With that border closed for so long, a lot of our businesses didn't have that additional revenue coming in from the Canadians shopping over here. So that really put a string on, or a, a hamstring on a lot of our local businesses. So the other, for all three of you, what we've been in Rural Insights asking across the Upper Peninsula on our weekly newsletter, Whispers, about what are some of the priority issues for you as a citizen? Uh, a couple that we hear repeatedly, repeatedly, and interestingly enough, infrastructure comes up from private citizens also, is child care costs and mental health availability, especially juvenile mental health. Can you, any of you have some experience with that you'd like to share as issues? Go ahead, Nick. Yeah, I'll share. So uh, excitingly, I'm one of those that has those issues right now. I have our first three month old uh, child, little girl. And uh, so we're, we're uh, just, my wife's going to be uh, leaving maternity leave soon. And we're having to balance away right now of, um, you know, my job as city manager and her working from home. Uh, we can't find childcare here in the Gross Point area. Um, it's it's very challenging to find uh, right now within Metro Detroit, and you're finding that um, uh, it was a problem before. And then once the pandemic hit, uh, we actually you know we're finding that several of these daycares were actually considering folding up or. Um, you know, having staffing challenges, you know, people not wanting to work in it anymore. They're afraid of COVID, uh, you know, and obviously in those health concerns. And so, you know, what I've been looking to do as city manager right now is uh, we need to diversify and, um, you know, how, how can we bring uh, daycare into Gross Point? Uh, we just have a, uh, a elementary school that closed two years ago with our school district. And so I've been trying to work with our school district and see if there's a early childhood care opportunity there that we can work with. Um, and, uh, you know, just trying to, uh, you know, help out our residents and of the fellow gross points. Uh, it's, it's something that's a major challenge, especially with working families that are going to Detroit uh, commuting. Um, and so we're working on that right now. On the uh, mental health side, um, I know it's something that we, I haven't seen too much in Gross Point Park. However, our public safety department has been working well with our uh, Detroit Police Department. Whenever we'll have individuals that could have, um, you know, those cases that we need, they need to seek the help that they do. And so that's really what our extent has been in Gross Point Park is working with our partners at uh, Detroit Police Department. But what about the uh, cost in childcare at Gross Point Park at a surround? Is it high? It is yeah. in the UP, very high. It's very high. Yeah, we're looking at right now in some cases, uh, you know, close to $400 or $400, $500 a week in, right now in some cases. And, uh, you know, I'm hearing too of uh, families now that uh, mothers, you know, or fathers are, you know, quitting their jobs or saying, hey, I, why should I work when it's cheaper for me to stay at home and, and do so? So that's that's really the challenge we're having in um, Gross Point. 
Brian, what about you with child care and mental health issues in Sault Ste. Marie, Chippewa County? Yeah, child care is an issue up here, and I can speak to it from the provider side, too. My wife does in-home daycare, and she's limited by the state of the number of kids that she can bring in, so she's capped at six. And we frequently get phone calls or emails from residents trying to find daycare services, and we have to turn them down, which... If it's a phone call, the conversation usually leads to, well, I guess my spouse or I are going to have to drop our job so that we can just stay home with the kid. You know, and in an area where there's employment shortages, if there was a better solution for daycare, you'd have those parents be able to enter in the workforce and be able to fill some of these other spots. So it's it's kind of an economic development issue to a certain extent, too. Um, our health, behavioral health issues in the community they're, they're, they're present up here. Our challenge, again, is being so remote and not always having those services is how do we get the services to, our, to the people that need them. Um, oftentimes, we're doing the long transfers. Just like um, Nick said, a lot of our contacts are with the police department. So what we're having to do is long transfers to facilities to get the people the services they need because um, they're just not present in the area right now. Well, one thing, Brian, you've got going on that would be interesting is uh, your major hospital, War Memorial in the Sioux, yep. just developed a relationship with the University of Michigan, therefore the Mott's Children's Hospital. Uh, that relationship might help with some of the issues around mental health and juvenile health, Correct. right? Correct, yep. So that partnership with War Memorial Hospital in mid-Michigan should open the door to a lot more services. Um, I think there was some anxiety about what that would actually work out to be for the community. But as the agreement stands right now, there's not gonna be any loss of current services here. And the way MidMichigan describes it to us is it should only open the door for more services. And being with that partnership with MidMichigan, um, War Memorial will now be on a priority list to be able to access those services, whereas before, if they called up to have those services, they had to get on a waiting list. So there'd be more access to those types of services for our residents now. That's great. That's great. Mr. Foster, what about down in Ludington? How do these two issues play out? Yeah, similar to Nick, uh, I had my first child in September of 2019. So COVID had really just started picking up. Um, and so six months later, when my wife was, uh, when my wife and I were required to go back to work full time, um, we were lucky enough to find a location um, in one of the daycares for a spot for him. Um, however, uh, out of the five or so daycare facilities, um, not in home, as, as Brian was talking about with his wife, out of the five daycare facilities, every single one of them has been closed for a period of time over this last year and a half period. One in particular in the last six months has had to close one day a week, rotating for every week. And then they had to close for two weeks at a time because they had a COVID contraction on staff. But because they don't have enough people to work, they had to close one day a week so that one room was closed or one age group was closed at a time. And I think you're seeing that across all of our facilities. Um, I know that uh, Senator Vanderwall, um, who is our uh, state senator, sits as the chair of the health policy committee at the state, um, has done his best to try to help with this. Um, the state put forward a TRICARE uh, cost share plan, um, which is a, a, a project idea where uh, the state would put in a third, the employer would put in a third, and the employee would put in a third. And if you had facilities in your municipality could sign up, you could be a part of this pilot program. Uh, Ludington has tried to put forward for that, but we were uh, thrown out uh, based on Grand Traverse County taking the winning bid on that one. But, you know, we've got to get a little bit more creative in how we allow Laura or MDHHS to license some of the in-home in facilities as well as how do we incentivize and get more folks to have uh, facilities? You know, we see down in Coopersville, they've got a, a union shop for training. Why couldn't you have a true facility where you provide care and you also train uh, new in-home and facility type workers for childcare? I think there are ways that we can do this. Um, on the mental health side, we actually had the uh, uh, representative from the governor's office in the office uh, last week, Friday, and my police chief brought up this exact issue because we are having to transfer folks from Ludington uh, down to either South Bend, Indiana or Northern Ohio 
um, if we don't have a location or anywhere near us uh, to house, uh, in, in particular, juveniles. So, you know, the cost to house them at these places is significantly higher, um, but also it's the time taken away. As Brian said, these long transfers, you're talking one to two officers going four hours, five hours, one way, um, that takes them out of the community to do their real job, uh, not necessarily uh, playing short for. Um, and so it's really un unfortunate that we're dealing with this, but again, these are big issues that as a community, we're trying to figure out how do we deal with. And so working with our partners at Community Mental Health, um, some of our local nonprofits, um, and, and it goes right back into the issue that I'm sure we're all dealing with, which is a homelessness issue um, between mental health and substance abuse. Homelessness in our area in particular is up in the last few years and, and COVID has not helped with that. And so I think these are all cyclical issues that continue to touch one another over and over again. Um, and, and COVID has exacerbated that in, in many of these cases. Interesting. So I want to ask you one last question uh, before I wrap up. And that is, so, you know, five years from now, the three of you decide to come up to my funeral and, uh, and you're all ready to do it. And, and you get through listening to all these boring speeches about me and you walk out together and going to go have a beer. What would you tell each other five years from now is your greatest success and still and something that still remains a problem? I know that's jumping way out, but just, you know, do a creative thinking. What, what's the, what do you think is something that'll be so hard to solve that'll still be there in five years? And what are you so excited about that in five years you'll see blossoming? Uh, they start, Brian, what do you think? <laughs> I think you should start with something else. Um, you know, we've got, I, I guess the, the easy one would be a lot of the infrastructure projects that we have going on. And it's, it's going to be a problem after they're done because we still have to continue to find a way of funding the maintenance and the preventative maintenance for those um, infrastructure projects. So for example, we we're redoing the carbide dock, the deep water port I mentioned earlier, as well as a road that would lead heavy, tra heavy traffic to that facility. All in all, it's about a $22 million project, which came in significantly over budget due to a lot of the COVID price increases. But once we get that project done, we still have to figure out a way of funding the maintenance of that. And the, the impetus on this whole project was the dock was condemned from use for freighters, cruise ships, or the case may be. And if we don't figure out a way of funding routine maintenance on assets like that, they will just become into a state of disrepair like it currently is. So, you know, and in five years, we'll be celebrating that dock is done and that road has been reconstructed but at the same time we still need to figure out how we're gonna fund those maintenance activities. Also, you might be celebrating a, a, a Blake State National Hockey Championship. You never know, you never know. So Hopefully. <laughs> Mitch, uh, uh, and hopefully Northern too. So Mitch, <laughs> what do you think? Uh, what do you think? So I think from a, from a, Hey, you know, Hey, pat myself on the back or the community on the back, as I talk about it over a beer with somebody, um, I, I think by in five years, I think we will have made a massive uh, dent in the housing affordability and capacity issue. Um, we have got great partners in the development and nonprofit world that are doing a lot of good work. Um, I have a planning commission and a city council that are very progressive in some of the things that they are doing. Um, to try to ease uh, restrictions uh, on the zoning side and to make it easier for folks to do those things. So I think in five years, I'd be very excited about it. Um, I hate to be a, uh, just continue to pile on, but I think the one thing that I'll say we, we've made progress, but hasn't changed, uh, is still a massive struggle is the infrastructure piece. Uh, I think that is going to be the elephant in the room for communities down the line. Um, and you can pair that up with pensions as uh, the, the areas that will need to be seriously reviewed in the years to come that will never go away and will always be a problem. Um, but I think the housing piece could be the one thing that I can pat our community on the back for in five years. Great. And Nick, what about you down there in Gross Point Park? 
Yeah, so two things immediately come to mind. If they come to fruition in the next five years, I'm going to be very happy. Uh, one, uh, I just did a groundbreaking for our new public works building through our tax increment finance authority. Uh, they've never had a building built for them properly. They've had a automobile bump shop. They were in a bakery that was added on over the years. I mean, you know, in the gross points, you don't have much space. And so if you're able to find a little bit of land and uh, get this through fruition, it's a, a great thing. And then the other thing that wasn't discussed today and I'm particularly proud of is uh, community policing. Uh, this is something that, um, you know, as we had with the events over uh, the last couple of years, you know, we operate in a public safety department in Gross Point Park, it, we're bordering the city of Detroit. And each Gross Point has their own public safety. And, you know, we operated kind of in this vacuum over the years of not really, you know, branching out or listening more to more ideas and such. And so I hired a uh, public safety director that um, typically, uh, you know, Gross Point would just hire in-house. And I did something that was different by going outside. And uh, I think it's very important for the community, um, especially our local communities, to hear from, uh, you know, our public safety police or fire that, you know, they're human too. And, you know, let's listen to the community and see what we can do to improve. Right now, my chief has just um, had a police advisory committee uh, working with different groups of people within uh, Gross Point Park, learning from what, what are they hearing in their communities regarding, you know, public safety and what we can do to improve. Um, little plugs in five years from now, uh, if we can work on that OPEB and pension, I'll be very excited about that. We've made some inroads there, uh, which has really helped us out. And then the last but not least, infrastructure. Um, working with my partners at Great Lakes Water Authority, Wayne County, Detroit, there's a lot of entities here in southeastern Michigan that need to work together. And so if there's a couple things we can do, and I'm, I'm very hopeful at the federal and state level, they can provide those to us, then I'd say we did our job. So that's what I hope for in the next five years. Well, thank, thank you, gentlemen. I, I know our viewers uh, will be able, when they listen to this, know why I'm so proud of the three of you and how proud Northern is to have three of its alum doing major work in municipal management uh, in this state, coping with unbelievable issues. Uh, I think uh, local government is the place that touches, that touches uh, more people's lives. It's where more innovation uh, happens and creativity uh, that directly impacts people. So you all are really important. So. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm proud to know each of you, and uh, I hope we can do this again soon. Absolutely. Thanks, Absolutely. guys. Thank you. Be, be safe.